Hi, my name is Brian Vent and welcome to another Words of Hope pastoral conversation that I've called Christmas Reflections and Perspectives. Today I want to reflect on the year that's been and then consider some perspectives on what it might mean to be a Christian next year in 2024. In June this year, at a conference in the United Kingdom called the Better Way Conference, a speaker called Laura Aboli did a talk titled Transhumanism, The End Game. I'm only going to play a part of her talk, but I think she describes well what we see happening all around us. She talks about transhumanism, which is the belief that we can and we should eradicate ageing as a cause of death, and that we can and we should use technology, that's artificial intelligence, to augment our bodies and our minds, that we can and we should merge with machines, remaking ourselves finally into the image of our own higher ideals. In reality, though, it's an attempt to do away with God entirely, becoming gods of our own making so we can live forever on our own terms. Let me play the video. Make no mistake, the final goal is to eradicate humanity as we know it. Once you understand the final destination, it becomes much easier to look back and identify the psychological conditioning, the biological tampering, the cultural grooming and the educational prepping that we have been subjected to for decades in preparation to making us accept a post-human future. It takes a lot of physical and psychological abuse to get an intelligent species like ours to agree to its own extinction. Most, if not all, that has transcended in the last 60 years was designed to get us closer to accepting such a dystopian reality. Whether you care to accept it or not, we live in a hyper-controlled matrix where our perception of reality is meticulously planned, managed, and executed in order to control and steer us in whichever direction they wish. And the direction is a post-human world. For this, they first needed to destabilize, dehumanize, and demoralize humanity through every means possible. The destruction of the nuclear family, children being indoctrinated by the state, abortion, the eradication of God and spirituality from education, life in mega cities and away from nature, toxic food, air and water, social media, replacing real human connection and interaction, engineered financial crisis and taxation, Endless wars and massive migration, stress, anxiety, depression, drugs and alcohol, constant fear-mongering, moral relativism as the new religion. And I could go on and on about how humanity has been influenced and forced to move away from all the things that give us strength, security, purpose and meaning. A weak, immoral, disconnected, ignorant and unhealthy population is an easy target for the next stage, the creation of an entire generation of androgynous beings. Masculinity is under attack psychologically, culturally and biologically. Women are being replaced in sports, entertainment and politics by men pretending to be women. And children are being indoctrinated at school to think that gender is a choice. The transgender movement is not a grassroots movement. It comes from the top. It has nothing to do with people's freedom of expression, sexuality, or civil rights. It's an evil psyop to, with a clear agenda to get us closer to transhumanism by making us question the most fundamental notion of human identity, our gender. If you don't know who you are, if you already identify as a hybrid between a man and a woman, you will be easily convinced to become a hybrid between human and machine. Gender ideology is the two plus two equals five from George Orwell's 1984 dystopian novel. It's the final test to see whether we will follow the most absurd party line towards our own extinction. But two plus two equals four. And no matter how you choose to dress, call yourself, or change your physique, will not change that. 
The sad reality, though, is that in the gaslighting process to get us closer to a post-human future, they have mentally and physically harmed an increasing number of children and young people, and it's only getting worse. This must be stopped. I'm sure many of you can identify with Laura's assessments here. She talks a lot of sense. And secondly, I recently engaged a friend in conversation on social media, and I have good respect for this friend and am impressed with his intellectual smarts. He once was a Christian, but is no longer a believer. The conversation thread went like this. Hindus have been waiting for Kalkai for 3,700 years. Anons are waiting for Trump. Extinction loons are waiting for the mammalian lemming rush. Every Western government expects we will all surely die if we burn a few more years of carbon. Buddhists have been waiting for Maitreya for 2,600 years. The Jews have been waiting for the Messiah for 2,500 years. And Christians have been waiting for Jesus for 2,000 years. The Sunnah has been waiting for Prophet Issa for 1,400 years. And Muslims have been waiting for a Messiah from the line of Muhammad for 1,300 years. The Shiites have been waiting for the Mahdi for 1,080 years. And the Druze have been waiting for Hamza ibn Ali for a thousand years. What a bunch of retards, my friend says. Keep waiting, effers. So I replied, so what are you waiting for, Bill? That's not his real name, but you tell us. Nothing or something? What drives you and motivates you to wake up each morning, my good friend? And his, he replied to me saying, Brian, well, right now, waiting, well, I'll do anything. Surviving another week in Sarong. I surely do not have any faith in anyone, anything, God, saint or politician saving me or anyone else. Just look at the historical record, he says, of those waiting, a saviour who got nothing. I was an evangelical leader once, he said. It's not as though I don't know the terms and conditions. I'm not waiting for anything other than the slow global realisation that demonic forces rule, including in the church, the state and commerce. Now, there was more to the thread, but I think Bill's perspective reflects what I see as wider community cynicism and despair and hopelessness in our world. I think many people, consciously or otherwise, are captured or hide behind what I see as a, a cynicism of convenience for their lives. Now, a third event only recently came into the public domain in an op-ed called Why I'm Now a Christian by Ian Percy Alley. The op-ed has taken a lot of people by surprise. And Ian is a Somali-born Dutch-American writer, activist, former politician and part of the New Atheist movement. And over the past 25 years, her political and social commentary has globally become highly regarded. She sees three issues facing Western civilization: The rise in authoritarian structures, as in China, Russia and Iran, the rise of militant Islam and the impacts of mass migration, and the failure of atheism and woke ideology to satisfactorily give an answer to the meaning and the purpose of life. She says, I've also turned to Christianity because I ultimately found life without any spiritual solace unendurable, indeed very nearly self-destructive. Atheism failed to answer a simple question, what is the meaning of and the purpose of life. In her summary paragraphs of her op-ed, she writes, the line often attributed to G.K. Chesterton has turned into a prophecy. When men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. In this nihilistic vacuum, she says, the challenge before us becomes civilizational. We can't withstand China, Russia and Iran if we can't explain to our populations why it matters that we do. We can't fight woke ideology if we can't defend the civilization that it's determined to destroy. And we can't counter Islam with purely secular tools. To win the hearts and minds of Muslims here in the West, we have to offer them something more than videos on TikTok. Fortunately, she says, there is no need to look for some new age concoction of medication and mindfulness. Christianity has it all. That is why I no longer consider myself a Muslim apostate, but a lapsed atheist. Of course, I still have a great deal to learn, but 
about Christianity and I discover a little more at church each Sunday. But I've recognised in my own long journey through a wilderness of fear and self-doubt that there is a better way to manage the challenges of existence than either Islam or unbelief had to offer. Now that, I suggest, is a monumental confession by Ayan. So what do we learn from all this? I want to put to you a response as two sides of a coin, beliefs and actions. If this is the world I've described that we live in, how do we turn people's hearts towards heaven? Do we really believe that Jesus is the only way to have a fulfilled life? I recently came across this quote by William Booth, which I found interesting when he said, Men cannot be turned from Satan to God with gentle phrases and lavender water. To save men is a desperate and agonising and wounding business. And as we move towards 2024, I ask myself the question, how seriously do I or, or we take this business of turning men's hearts towards heaven? And whether we even should. I was reminded, though, of the words of Jesus recorded in Matthew's history, where he says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Reaching the hearts of people has always been the core message of Jesus. And then I was reminded of Peter's sermon in Acts where he says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So how seriously do we believe this? Do we really believe God exists and has revealed himself to humanity as the babe of Bethlehem? When we sing the song, Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let all the earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness. Do we really believe this when we sing it? At Christmas... The danger for all of us is our proneness to, to dilute or sanitise the Christmas story to mean nothing more than I wish you a jolly Christmas with fragrant pine and cookies filled with carols and giggling and plastic police car chases with hugs and silence and joy. Happy holidays. We talk about Christmas, but do we actually believe in the Christ, the incarnate God-man who came to challenge our cultural view of reality and then offers to transform our lives into his image. We do Christian stuff a bit like a shopping exercise where we give it a go and see if we like it or as a subscription magazine that comes every three months and we flick our eyes over it and go to church once in a while and then shelf it till the next issue. A few months back, a movement started called 832, and I remember when it was first promoted, and the promoter said, if you want to know what it refers to, go Google it, and so I did. I found it was the biblical text from John 832, and it's become a bit of a rallying call with good intentions, I might add, when it says the truth will set you free. My concern is that it will be just another arbitrary take on the message of Christ that ignores the deeper contextual meaning. Jesus doesn't allow us to think about truth as merely a, a collection of facts or data or ideals competing for our attention. In the previous verse and that we just read, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Then in verse 36, just a little bit later, he describes himself as, as the one who sets people free. He says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Then later in John 14, he, he says he is in and of himself the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father God except through him. That is an extraordinary claim. 
In the illustrations that I referred to earlier, Laura Aboli in her blogging is, is open about her nine-year personal search for truth. And from what I can read, she's very close, if not already at the point where she accepts Jesus as this revealed truth. My friend, on the other hand, rejects any notions of absolute truth, even though he once believed so. And Ayan Hersi Ali has found herself now at the foot of the cross. In her own words, I attend church each Sunday and each time I learn a little more. She says, but I still have a lot to learn. Now let's consider the other side of the coin that I'm talking about here. If all I have described is what we believe, how then does it affect us? How should we live? What should be our response if we truly believe this message? How will it impact our lives? Well, let me suggest four things. We will confront the issues of our lives. Paul nails this in Romans 12 when he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical and intelligent act of worship. Don't be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you might prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. But secondly... We will have a, a lifetime of purpose. Jesus said himself in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. That, my friends, is a lifetime mission of service for God. But thirdly, We'll also become biblical apologists. I'm right. I, I, I'm thinking of Peter here, where he says, "But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. Be willing to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. We will speak into the cultural circumstance of our time if we take this message seriously." And then fourthly, I suggest that we will be emotionally engaged. Psalm 126 says, Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. You and I won't ever be content again with Christian superficiality. We will become passionate about that which we believe. Now let me tie all this together. My wife and I were talking about that William Booth quote uh, a little while ago that says, Men cannot be turned from Satan to God with gentle phrases and lavender water to save men as a desperate, agonising and wounding business. And, I, uh, and we were talking about it and I said to my wife, What does God have to do to get people's attention? And at that time my wife was facing a terminal cancer diagnosis and, and she said to me that lavender water idea she said I've spent most of my life on the fringes of Christian faith and now I can no longer stay there God calls me to confront it and I think we're all probably in a similar place God gets our attention some of the time and then like a child we lose interest or get sidetracked from what we believe Perhaps we waltz the fringes of faith and never take it seriously or consider its implications. It's my prayerful desire for you that 2024 will be a year where we take a good look into our life and take the scriptures and our faith more seriously than we have ever done before. God is looking for people who will act on what they believe. And like Jesus, be moved with compassion for those who are like sheep without a shepherd. So I wish you a, a blessed Christmas. Thanks for watching 
and we'll talk again another time. Bye.